I'm here in the Wilderness Heights in the Western Cape of South Africa and just entering a patch of forest near my house. Forest is uncommon down here. There's uh, just a few fragments remaining, mostly in these higher rainfall areas along these mountain chains. Previously they were widespread in the Pleistocene, some I think it's about 2.6 million to 20,000 years ago. They were all over the subcontinent and now they're just secluded to these little pockets along mountain chains from from here at sea level where I am in the Western Cape right up through South Africa into Zimbabwe into Malawi and uh, I don't know exactly how far they go but some of the biggest fragments of this of these Afro temperate forests as they're called are here in the, the garden route and this one that I'm in right now well that I'm just in the edges of is new growth this was all cut down for cattle pastures and has been regrowing for some 20 years so this is a pretty early successional stage you can see there's a lot of senescent stuff behind me this dry dead vegetation in fact if I just tap it you'll see that it breaks apart I don't know if you can see that but it's just been sitting there dry and dead for a long time and normally you would have a lot of megafauna in this area but most notably elephants there were savanna elephants that would roam into the forest in these parts and they've been locally extinct for some hundred years or so incidentally i actually found an elephant molar down in the stream just the other day proving that they were in the, this steep topography and you could imagine an elephant or or a buffalo or something moving through this this kind of brush and just breaking apart all this dry stuff and getting it down onto the ground where it's available for decomposers and indeed it's one of the characteristics of this forest that's like, unusual here in the western cape where you've got a deep litter layer i mean there's a lot of stuff here there's a lot of food for mesofauna and all kinds of other soil arthropods to break down and form a nice rich soil. It's a little bit dry at the moment. We're in the middle of winter, but we've been having strange weather lately, climate change and all. We've had these dry spells, these hot dry spells, which is coming out of one, one of them. So this is uncharacteristically dry for the leaf litter. But still, there's a lot going on here. Um, I'm sure we will see there. These are all over the place. It's a little trapdoor spider of some kind, a megalomorph, probably. Um, I don't know my spiders that well, but I've seen those guys. They're all over my lawn even. They come and hang out with their legs. They'll mostly be females in those kinds of burrows and wait for prey to walk by. You can kind of go and drop a little cricket or a beetle nearby and they'll run out and grab it and pull it down into the hole and that's how they feed and you can see here these are old blackwoods they're an invasive Australian acacia that uh, it's a big problem in this area these ones have been ring barked some years ago and they're standing dead this whole area was actually infested with them and and they they kind of exclude indigenous vegetation they're they're outside of their ecological context here, so they, they're not subject to the sorts of natural enemies that the indigenous vegetation is, which allows them to just dominate. And they can exclude indigenous vegetation from whole areas and create sort of a monoculture. The black wattle, another Australian acacia, does the same thing. And there's a few right here that have come up in the forest. I've recently ringbarked these myself. But they take a little while to die by that method. They're also controlled by a biological agent, biological control agent. Let me see if I can pull one down for you here. Oh, here's a better one. Now, these are what they call galls. So there's a little midge tiny little midge 
that they collect in the wild and, and rear them and then release them at certain sites. They do all kinds of tests and quarantine for many years to make sure that, that they're highly specific to the target species, that they're not going to go and affect some indigenous species. And uh, what they do is they lay an egg on the developing flower bud of the tree. And the egg secretes some sort of hormone. It's, as far as I understand, it's a little bit mysterious, the biochemistry of this, but the, the long and short of it is the egg secretes some other chemical that hijacks the development of the flower and causes it to instead develop that gall, that lump of tissue. And the plant funnels sugars and water and all, all, all the things that the midge larva needs. That's like a little worm, you know, like a little grub inside there and it, it feeds off of that stuff and develops until it pupates and then emerges out of there as an adult and flies off to find a mate and complete the life cycle by mating and then laying eggs on more black wattle buds. So that's quite a nice measure that, they, that they've put into practice in the past few years. But uh, the seed banks that those plants establish last for, they estimate hundreds of years. So while those biocontrol measures can reduce the seed set, by something like 99% and then they have other agents like they've got a seed weevil that'll eat whatever 1% gets through there's still this long lasting bank of seeds in the soil that will keep on coming up so yeah invasive species control is an ongoing and uphill battle in South Africa as in many parts of the world and there's always new invasives arriving that'll be a theme as we move through this forest this area it's just so lush things grow so fast because the rainfall so high unfortunately the same is true for the invasives just found a luri feather in the nice luri beautiful beautiful birds and quite common here uh, they're almost parrot like in their in their body shape i'm not much of a bird expert myself but the luris have this beautiful kind of emerald metallic sheen that you can catch on this feather on most of their body and then this bright ruby red under their wings that flashes as they fly and they're not very adept flyers they've, they've got a, a sort of basal form of locomotion where they hop they've got strong legs and they hop high up into the trees they leap out and glide down to wherever they're headed and then hop up again just down in the valley floor here below my house uh, you can see the understory sort of opens up a little bit it's kind of nice one can get around a bit better and you've got quite a thick canopy in these afro temperate forests the plant diversity can be exceptionally high depending on the light conditions and the exact rainfall of the area and also its history as I say this is a new growth Patch of forest, so it's probably not as diverse as it could be. I try and tread a little quietly here because we can sneak up on interesting wildlife sometimes. I was just hearing a few luries a moment ago, and they seem to have quietened down. The dryness from the past few days has reached even down here into the deeper parts of the valley, which I'm surprised by. So it'll be interesting to see anything looks different to usual. Still hear a few frogs carrying on. The stream doesn't tend to flow very often. It just comes down and flashes after the rain. I'm not sure what its history was like, but uh, the watershed seems to have undergone a lot of transformation, a lot of building, a lot of invasive plants, which tends to have that effect on the, on the flow. Um, if you have a replete soil ecosystem, the structure of the soil is such that it's much more porous from all the soil fauna. So earthworms kind of get a lot of the press, but there's all sorts of other, what they call mesofauna, that are a size class down. Uh, the largest of those will be a couple millimeters long and many will be microscopic. And they all contribute to the structure of the soil. So it's this it's almost like a it's almost like a fractal pattern you've got 
tunnels within tunnels within tunnels within tunnels. And the difference in size between the biggest and the largest soil organism is, I'll have to check this, but probably bigger than the difference in size between the blue whale and, and the guppy. There's, there's just a lot going on down there. Because we can't see it, we tend not to recognize <laughs> just how complex it is. Look in the stream bed and we see this weed. I forget what it's called. It's an invasive weed that just dominates the waterways here. So anyone's guess what effect it has on the, uh, the flow rates and so on. But uh, invasive species typically have deleterious effects on ecosystem function. So probably not a good thing. It's extremely difficult to eradicate. Just a tiny little piece will sprout roots and carry on growing. So it's one of those that mechanical removal will, will probably just ne never get a handle on. It will take some kind of biological control agent to, to sort of rein it into the ecology of the area. That's the trouble with the invasive species is once they're here, you're never getting rid of them. The best you can do is keep them under control, keep them from having this domination effect. And as far as I can tell, biological control is the, the best means for doing that. And indeed, that's how it, it happens in nature. That's how... We don't have the, you know, certain most successful species just dominating all the world. We have diversity. Um, we have biodiversity. Things, things compete with each other. They predate one another. They cooperate with each other. And it creates these complex networks of many, many species. So what we'd like to do is try and get this stuff and the blackwoods and the black wattle and all the other invasive species just get them part of the ecology of the area so that they can play nicely with everything else. These forest ecosystems often tend to be more driven by invertebrates than vertebrates. That's in contrast to, for instance, a, like a savanna ecosystem that people love to go on game drives in and so on because it has all these charismatic megafauna in huge abundance that seem to like really drive the ecosystem by consuming vegetation and then they're depositing their dung that other things feed on and indeed the mega herbivores themselves are predated by lions and hyenas and cheetahs and all these lovely furry animals get a lot of while in a place like this afro temperate forest it's it's the tiny things that do a lot of the work. 3%, 3% of biodiversity is vertebrates. And the other 97% is invertebrates. A big chunk of that is insects. And most of those are undiscovered, undescribed, and many are already extinct. So that's my invertebrate hobby horse. But if you look over here, it's a bit dried out, so it's not looking as lovely and loamy as it normally does. But you can see these little pellets. There's a big arthropod that is a major detritivore in this area. Detritivore eats detritus, so decaying vegetable matter. And these are the droppings. And that creature is pull millipede. Now, they like moist conditions, so they'll be out here tonight when the dew sets in and cools down. But right now, we might see some. If you go out in the conditions that's most favorable to them, like uh, during or just after rain, it's all you can do not to step on them. There's so many of them out here. So they seem to be, uh, again, I haven't done any, any study on this, but they seem to be major drivers of nutrient cycling in this ecosystem. A lot of people don't know this, but if you just have a magnifying glass and a flashlight and some time and some curiosity, there's an amazing world just right down in what can look like a pretty uninteresting piece of ground. So let's see what we can see right here. We're in the stream bed, so it's a bit more moist. And maybe we can get a sense of what sort of activity there is. There's a lot of these guys around. They seem to be some kind of tiny beetle. 
though they may also be a juvenile Mitra. I haven't actually taken a close look at them, I'll admit, because there's just so many of them that I always thought I'd have another chance. Interesting. Their sheer abundance makes me wonder if they're not also invasive, because they really are just crawling over the stream bed when it's a little wetter. I, mean, I don't have to look far to find you some more. There's a couple that I'm meeting. Let me focus right. There's just loads of them. some good examples of our saprophytic fungi gobbling up this this tree trunk big magnificent shelf fungi I don't know my fungi well but you don't have to know the names of them to appreciate their beauty and the role that they play Well, there's not really much there. It's pretty dry, that log. It seems like it's some kind of harder wood. Often, a log in these conditions is just like a sponge. You can just punch the knife right into it. You can even punch your hand into it like butter. But this one, it's pretty tough. There's a lot more hungry mushrooms. Beautiful colors on them. And up above as well, just devouring that tree trunk up above the stream. So you can see the kind of moisture that must be available in this trunk compared to that other one. Yeah, it's soft. Yeah. 
It's nice and moist like a great big sponge. Just eats into it. Like pulled pork or something. Pulled pork for the shelf fund. <laughs> Ooh. I stumbled upon a full millipede, a full size one. It's already curled up, the first sign of trouble. That's well, yeah, it's still a slightly small one, not quite as big as they get, but getting closer to the true size. It's caught something while trying to close up so we can actually get a little look inside. Hello. Yeah. I'm new to this forest and I've truly enjoyed getting acquainted with it. Just emerging from the outskirts after the steady climb up the hill. Nice bit of rain has come to keep me cool. Whew. Oh, another lovely day in paradise. 